So hi everyone, I'm Ignacio or Nacho. I am based in London and I work with uh, many game developers across the Western Europe region. So many of you, in fact, I see a lot of familiar faces. So thanks for coming after the break. Thanks for being here. And today we're going to talk about all games, which uh, in some cases, in some instances, might be your first success. And we are going to understand whether these, they age better or worse. And the goal of this session is basically, well, that was, that was a stronger introduction. So the, the, the goal of this session is essentially to understand what are the different strategies. So if these games are becoming a burden or a technology debt, or if these are actually the, the new opportunity that you can actually follow. And to do that, I will have on stage two fantastic speakers. So Eric, CEO of Do Dreams, and uh, as well, Annette, VP of Business and Marketing from Dirty Bit. So I wanted to start with a very uh, easy example, because when we were thinking about old games, then I thought, all right, um, let's look at all, uh, all games and how, how they look like today. So we have two games here, uh, both of them by the Russian developer Games Insight. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with them, but Tribes was published uh, six years ago in 2012. And we have as well Transfer Empire published in 2014, four years ago. And there's a big difference among these developers. I don't know if you, maybe you can guess. If you are obviously working for Games Insights, you would know. Okay, so I'm, I'm just going to, um, uh, so essentially what happens with these games is that one of these games is actually a priority today. Still, it represents a big part of the revenues. So when we're, I, was, I was looking at, at old games, we basically identified that some of these old games, they became an evergreen title. And even though it's been a long time since they were published, they still represent a very important source of revenues for the developer. And as well, this translates into having these resources into the game. And Transport Empire would be part of that back catalog. So the first thing to consider is this one. If we look at another two examples here, both of them in this case are top priorities for both developers. However, if we look at the right side, we might think that this game is, it looks classier or at least a a slightly older. And in fact, Old School by RuneScape, RuneScape Old School by Jagex, was published in PC for the first time 17 years ago, so it makes sense, while Respawnables Digital Legends uh, was published five years ago only. However, if you are a fan of RuneScape Old School, you would know that the game hasn't been launched yet in mobile. It's in fact launching in two weeks, the 2nd of November. So when we are talking about like, uh, why is a, a game old or how is an old game, how do we define this? Is it like by the launch date, by when the game was released in PC, in the case of RuneScape, or maybe it's just one year, five years, or two years? So this is two things that we need to have in mind, and then we were trying to figure out how these games are performing nowadays in play. And we had to take two assumptions, which are very uh, big assumptions. In the first case was when the game was published, and so we are going to look at games that they were published four years or older, and then also, if this game represents a top priority for the company, if the game is driving most of the revenues, then in this case, we would consider an outlier. So we're making the assumption of like less than 50% of the overall portfolio of the developer. So if we look at this, and we take this into, uh, into account, and we look at the top games by revenue and downloads in the Play Store, we will see that, in fact, all games are very much alive and kicking. And what it means is that, so first of all, all games these games with this uh, four years old and as well uh, less than 50%, they represent 17% of those top revenue games in the Play Store. And as well, they receive new users every day. 17.5% of the downloads in the past six months were gone to these titles. From an engagement perspective, it's something similar. We see that these old games, they seem to have very engaged communities and, and fans that they keep playing. And on average, 59% of daily active users, more than the newer games. On the other hand, the design of the games, it seems to be short, uh, shorter terms, so shorter times. And we see that on average, they spend less time uh, per daily active user, so 29% less. Also, we take into account monetization within our purchases in particular. We will see that all games, they tend to monetize slightly less better, and we see minus 18% in our DAO. And last but not least, as everything old in this life, it tends to have some issues. And we see that also from a vitals perspective, they have uh, on average 50% more crash rates and 20% more ANRs. So in a nutshell, 
these games, these uh, four-year-old games, they have a lot of new uh, fresh installs, new users coming every day. They still make a lot of significant rev revenue, although might be slightly lower. And they have some issues in terms of, uh, in terms of for example, uh, vitals and crash rates and ANRs. And the question here is, is this a burden? Do we consider these games as technology debt, or do we consider it an opportunity? And so there's two very clear ways, uh, but there is three routes. So there's three common ways that uh, developers are following. So if you go to the, the, the very much, I consider this as a burden, the ultimate case is to unpublish the game. And this is the case that we will hear from Dirty Bit later on. If you go on the other hand, I consider this as my biggest opportunity, then uh, why not I put more resources into this game and try to revamp it and become, again, one of my top drive, uh, like drivers of, of revenue. And this is the case uh, from Do Dreams later on. And what, when, when we asked developers, we found out that majority of you, they, you go into what we call the, the back catalog mode or long tail or status quo. And so we asked, how do uh, games end up in this mode? So there's a couple of common factors. So many times we see that live ops, new content updates, they don't have the same effect as well. The ROI campaigns, they try to stabilize. LTV is very similar to CPIs. Other factors could be also affecting, for example, um, cannibalization between your own games. You launch a new game, and you see a lot of users from the previous one going to this title, and as well external factors such as competitors or new genres that are appearing. And does this mean that the game is dead? Well, actually, no, and that's, that's for sure. Like, we, we still have very engaged communities. And as uh, Games Insights was sharing with us, brand perception is very important, and keeping alive this game is critical for them. But also, generally, they are very profitable. So if we look at Games Insights as well, we see that all games or long-tail games generate 14% of the total revenues. And on average, they have 50% more profits than the newer ones. So what are the key challenges? So I put like three key challenges. There might be more. But the main ones would be, first, a spaghetti code. So some problems with the SDKs. We've seen that they have some issues with uh, technical uh, problems like ANRs and crash rates. Also, as well, monetization is hard to keep up with the CPMs updating the mediation platforms. As well, sometimes you might see that your game is using agencies that they do not exist or networks that they are not anymore. And last, team. Every developer is looking forward to work in the next title, in the next big hit, and convincing them, motivating the users or the developers to actually work in this game might be hard. So just to finalize this, some very few um, uh, recommendations from uh, also another developer here today with us, so uh, Obibi. Um, uh, so we have, to tackle these precise challenges, we can think about like, the ways to optimize uh, target SDK, how we can keep updated the game, the, or the versions of the engine, in an efficient way, maybe outsourcing. Another way also of thinking is like, how do we keep an efficient monetization by updating automatically the CPMs or by, for example, automatizing the customer support whenever the players are using in-app purchases. Another uh, very interesting example, automatizing live ops. So for example, the Halloween uh, sales or the Halloween live ops that you're running this year might be the same as the, the last year, but users, they might not know, the players might not know that this is exactly the same. So, and that keeps like, the game fresh and alive. And last but not least, we've seen today a number of examples of how can you improve your uh, conversion via store listings, for example, country targeting. We have it now. And this will help you to drive and continue driving those users to your game. And with this, I would like to invite to stage Annette Staloy, who is going to talk about a different way, which is in this case, is to actually go and publishing. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming. Uh, it's my first time at the Playtime event and my first time in Berlin, actually. So I joined the games industry in the Norwegian studio called Dirty Bit three years ago. And I work in the management team together with the founders. So working for a small company means that I work with both management, business development, marketing, ad ops. DirtyBit was founded in 2011, and I've been part of the company since we were eight, and to a team of 18 today. We're based in Bergen on the west coast of Norway. Anyone who has been in Bergen here? 
Oh, quite a few. Cool. So we're owned by the founders and us employees. We make and publish free-to-play games, and we monetize on inner purchase and ads. Two of the founders grew up together in Bergen, and they had many fond memories of beating each other in Mario Kart. So when they started making games, they could find a lot of multiplayer games, but they were all turn-based. So they took on the challenge of making a real-time multiplayer game. And remember, this was in 2011, so uh, this was uh, quite unique at the time. This is how it looked. Have anyone played it? Nice. So the game started spreading in schools in the US, and it went viral in social media. It trended, uh, trended on Twitter, and it reached the top charts overall in the US and many other countries. Not bad for a very small and young team from Norway. So in April this year, we had three games live, all in the Fenrun series. As you can see, Fenrun that was launched in 2012, the next one in 2014. So even if we had all these games live, the old games were still getting downloads and had significant user bases. But most of our efforts were into the what I call the new game, which is launched in 2016. So what we saw is that even if it brings most of our revenue, it only gets about half of our downloads. So fast forwarding a few months, this is how it looks today. So now we can see that the new game, newest game, has more than 99% of our downloads and is also bringing in most of the revenue. So what happened? Last year, our current strategy, as it had been for uh, several years, was to grow the user base. And we actually reached 100 million downloads, all organic, no paid UA. That's pretty cool, right? So as our network in the industry grew, and many of you started sharing numbers with us, and we uh, got a little help from App Andy Premium, we realized that we had a lot to improve when it comes to monetization. We hired a full-time analyst, and that helped us transitioning from basing most of our decisions on gut feeling to really diving into the numbers. We started doing some UA, and it became more clear that we need a new strategy to increase our revenue. So that's what we've been doing this year, is focusing on the numbers, analyzing everything. And our analyst introduced this term of MMM, making more money. Maybe you do that the same as well. Uh, we have been very careful, scared of harming the user experience. So we have been uh, in trying to enhance our monetization, and it's been well received, and everybody is happy. The analyst is happy, and we're happy. We have been working more focused with ASO, and I brought this example here. When we first launched Funrun, th Funrun 3 Arena, we didn't even call it Funrun 3, we called it Funrun Arena, because our gut feeling said that that was the right thing to do. So this was the icon, also based on gut feeling. A year after launch, we did an experiment in Google Play, just adding the number three. And as you can see the results, it became clear to us that we should update the, both the title and the icon. So Fenrun 3 was clearly our star. But what's the challenge? But uh, the monetization, when we compared it to the older titles, two to four times better ARP DAO. Retention was clearly a lot better. Technology, we built the newest game in Unity, which made it easier for us to maintain. This is the game where we had the dedicated team and want to deliver the best gameplay and best user experience. And I know that Nacho and Toby, if you've seen their talks before, you might have heard them talking about we live in a post-launch world. And we agree, and we plan to do live ops for this game to improve it, make it even better for a long time. So the challenges, as you can see from some numbers from Appany showing our most important keyword. The users searching for our game found the old titles, and they were a bit confused, it seemed, to what to download. We even got a big featuring for Funrun 2, and thank you very much. We appreciated that, but it didn't help us grow Funrun 3. We tried to unoptimize. I don't know if you've tried it. It can be pretty tricky when you have millions of downloads with a lot of historical data. When we launched Fenrun 1 and 2, we had 
organic uh, growth. We had the games went viral, hit the top charts. We couldn't do that the same. And we were competing not only with all the games in the market, but also ourselves. So here you can see uh, what happened when we started testing, removing Funrun 1 from Turkey, where we had a significant user base. People started downloading Funrun 2, not Funrun 3. So when we removed Funrun 2 from the market, finally people were starting to download Funrun 3 as well. And it started to grow. So we decided to unpublish, like Nacho talked about. We saw from the test that we expected uh, the new game to absorb 90% of the downloads. Funrun 3 was the game we wanted our users to download, and the monetization was better. We wanted to be open with our community and inform them that we were going to focus on Funrun 3 going forward, and we expected a backlash. We were right. Funrun 3 absorbed most of the downloads, and it's been growing since. So, we increased our user base in Funrun 3. Overall, we lost users, but that was because we remo removed uh, uh, all the games. We managed to increase our revenue. This is from April to August, and August and September has been looking pretty nice as well. We have been able to free up resources to do the great live ops we want to do for Funrun 3. So our key learnings is we tested in a market where we had a significant user base. We knew what numbers to look for. And we made decisions based on the key metrics. And we were prepared to let the first game go, even if there is a lot of nostalgia there as well. We planned for the best and the worst case scenario, and we had, some, had a plan B. And do not underestimate the impact on your community. And I brought this example today because we still have a very active Funrun 2 community. They even made a petition to make us bring the game back. Every time we post something in social media, like I did today from here, first <laughs> reply is, please remember Funrun 2. And this, they made a very touching video with music. So this happens every time. So even though some of our players rated Funrun 3 with one star because they want us to bring it back. We have a very active community playing Funrun 3, creating content and helping us grow organically. So for us, the right decision was to divest. So I have the honor of inviting my good friend Eric to the stage to t talk about their approach, which was a bit different. Thank you. There you are. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. My name is Eric, and uh, I'm the CEO of Do Dreams. It's really exciting to be here in Berlin at Playtime, and honored to share the stage with my dear friends Nacho and Annette. Uh, I will present today, or talk about our portfolio strategy. I will present what kind of choices we made, ex explain what was the logic behind those choices, and then present what kind of impact it had on our business. <clears throat> At Do Dreams, we make games where players do stuff that dreams are made of. So we are Do Dreams. And uh, we are the makers of this uh, drive ahead portfolio of games. This key art is for our game Drive Ahead. Drive Ahead is a gladiator car fight game. So what that means is you get points by hitting your friend in the head with a car. And thank you for that reaction, because that's what 100 million people all around, all around the world think also when they decided to download the game. So it's, it's a really fun and simple premise. And in our vision, drive-ahead games are the best way to play, share, and watch fun gaming content. So we have a very large and active a community built around video for the game, and thanks to this community, we're getting 100,000 new downloads every single day. And uh, this is what the game originally looked like. So it was developed for a sauna party by one of our employees. So he was having some beers with his friends, and 
and they came up with this idea that, hey, what would it look like if a tank would be battling a, a lorry truck, and let's put a garbage truck there and a, against a go-kart or something like that. So even today, the game looks pretty much the same. In the core gameplay, of course, we've brought a lot of other stuff to it. So that the first game went live in 2015, and then in 2016, we decided that let's have a portfolio strategy. Business logic there is that we'll do cross-promotion, we're going to get the higher number of daily active users, and then we're going to make more money. And, uh, and then also, we had realized that when we made the first game, maybe we weren't so experienced or we made some mistakes. So, you know, instead of going through the trouble of updating the first game, let's just fix everything that we did wrong at one go. And uh, we were quite experimental with it. So we decided that instead of just making the first, this is the second game, let's experiment a little bit. So we had an idea for drive ahead sports. So you can play soccer and other sports with cars. So we made it first an event in the original game. And when we told fans that summer is over, soccer is going away, then they started begging us to bring it back. And we said, well, you can play it, but it's going to be it's a, a standalone game. And in 2016, actually, it had significant contribution to the studio revenue. In 2017, we realized that this portfolio approach isn't working perfectly for us. So Drivehead Sports turned out to be even more a skill game than the original game. Uh, so it's, it's reaching a more niche audience. We were able to be better in the free-to-play design of the game. So for example, ArpDAO is 2.5 times higher. But that doesn't really help when you're reaching only 20% of the players from the original title. And the really ugly thing we did in 2017 was that we tried to fix everything once again at one go. So we made a major change where, you know, changed the UI, UX, added a saga map and tons of other things and everybody hated it. So we lost half of the players and revenue and retention was was almost destroyed and nearly killed the game. And then we also went all in with AR. So we made a game called Drive Ahead Mini Golf. So if we have car gladiators, this is what they do in their free time. And it uh, turned out that we were there a little bit too early and do, were doing fancy motion controls with the device. People were playing mini golf like this, and uh, it didn't work out either. So we discovered that you know, this is a bit risky as an approach. So the decision was that let's focus on the original title. It's getting that 100,000 new players a day. Good things are that there's high engagement and virality through the community. And we realized that you know, we're only, we've only scratched the service, surface with monetization potential there. So that's a picture of our team there with our head of studio talking to them. And this is the group that was given the task to, to revamp the game. We, our approach was the following. We realized that it's too much risk changing things in the game, like making too big changes. But we had started doing live ops, which is a really great place to change the rules of the game. And, and uh, we see what works there and then bring it into the, the actual game. And uh, so what happened next was that we started doing these iterations. So first, we redid the first time user experience to teach the players how to watch ads as a daily habit and show the value of growing your collection in the game. And then in the second iteration was our live ops events where we had the play gave the players the feature that they could build a deck of cards a deck of cars that they use in a boss fight. So both experiments increased uh, ad engagement rate by 50%, and ad engagement is one of our, our key KPIs. So the lessons we learned here was that when you launch a new game in a portfolio, you have to very clearly define what is the positioning of that product and why should it exist as a standalone game. And it has, what has worked really well for us is validating 
new features, content, even new games uh, with the community. We found that when we openly say that this is the good stuff of our game and this is what we're trying to fix, it actually attracts new talent and, and ignites the passion of the team. So we've had really senior people join the studio because they say that the problems you guys have are fun problems to solve. So let's fix monetization when you have a big community. And uh, you might wonder what happened to Drive Ahead Sports. So we still have it live, and we empowered a fresh, young, talented team to take ownership, ownership of the game, and they're doing a really good job and, and uh, really battling against the Drive Ahead team. So that's all for me. So now I'd like to invite Nacho Mone, Mone, Mr. Money Oreo back on the stage to do his conclusions. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Pontikowski. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so to conclude, I'm, I'm gonna take a couple of slides. So first of all, remind that, and this is a quote from Eric, in fact, which is like, if a player has downloaded the game and he's a new player, he doesn't know, or he or she doesn't know that the game was published five years ago. Uh, five years ago. So this is something like really important to remember to keep it fresh and, and, and have that in mind. And so just to conclude, um, so we've seen that all games still receive a big number of the downloads uh, nowadays. So this is uh, in, incredibly interesting for you to think about like how to explore and to test also that they have uh, engaged communities and then they can be very profitable. So what you can do, and I think uh, some of the, the insights that we've learned, so first of all, take uh, decisions based on metrics and be ready to let the, the first success, your baby, go. Uh, well, that was the case of, of 30-bit. As well, consider the community. We've seen that the community still is going to be always, is going to be a problem or is going to, like, is going to react in some way. So how do you plan before and publishing if you take that route? And if you decide to revamp the game, I think Eric mentioned some managerial lessons. He's a, his insights on his experience with exciting the team, creating, uh, motivating the, the developers in order to really work together to grow the game again. And with this, thank you very much.